Okay, welcome back to another episode of The Front Three with myself, Big Will, Coach Dan, and off the substitutes bench, the one and only, our prodigy himself, AJ. How are you guys doing? <laughs> well, we're back, aren't we, baby? We're back, obviously, you know, had a few um, off-field issues, but we're back online. We're back in the starting lineup, and uh, it's great to have you guys back on here. And obviously, we've got a very... Hey. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's good to have the three of us back on. Can't wait. Um, so, Coach, is AJ going to face any disciplinary um, action or not? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's something that we have to keep in house. Let's not get our, our listeners... Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> but I, I didn't breach any contract. I didn't... It wasn't bad off-field stuff. It was just family stuff. So, in light of this, it's no disciplinary. I'm saying... <laughs> fair enough fair enough okay um before we get started um we just want to thank all our listeners and downloaders um who have been um listening to us throughout the year um if you haven't please make sure that you go and um, follow us on twitter and instagram also please subscribe to our youtube channel we've got something very special lined up in the new year so please make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend subscribe to our youtube channel but in today's episode, we're actually going to preview Sunday's big clash between Manchester United and Leeds United. And to help us is a top, top journalist. He grew up near Edinburgh in Scotland and previously worked for the Yorkshire Evening Post as its chief football writer. Now he's a staff writer covering all things Leeds for the Athletic. It is the one and only Phil. Hey, how are you doing, Phil? I'm very well, thank you. You've, you've got my background worked out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we have to do on this show um okay so let's get into before we um, preview the game itself let's talk a little bit about Leeds and um, I was reading one of your articles recently and you say you said quote when Leeds are good they have a tendency to be very good when their performances drop the results tend to be unflattering so for those people who haven't really watched Leeds this season just give us um an overview of how they've done this season so far in the Premier League it's been very similar to the championship um, in terms of the performances. There hasn't been much deviation for Bielsa at all um, when it comes to the way the team play, the way they're set up, the formation and, and tactics that he uses. And, and you know, th there's been no deviation from the start. So we weren't expecting it to be any different. We weren't expecting Leeds to be any more negative um, or mm -hmm. to be any less attacking. Um, and I think I think that's just about right, really. When 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 they've impressed this season, I think a lot of people have been surprised by the way that they're able to mix it with sides like Everton and Liverpool and, and Manchester City. But what you tend to find with Bielsa, because of the way Leeds play, and, and if I give you a couple of examples, you'll find that in the, the 93rd minute against Everton, where they were 1-0 up, um, they had six players um, in or around the Everton's box on, on the attack looking for another goal. It was the same against Newcastle uh, on Wednesday night. There was there was no holding back. But because they are expansive and because they are open and, and do commit players forward, there is always the risk that, that when they do lose or when it goes wrong, it, it's going to be full one as it was at home to Leicester, or full one as it was um, against Palace. And, and they're not perfect. And, you know, the, there was always going to be a bit of acclimatisation uh, this season, a bit of adapting to a, a better division and, and a better standard of player across the, the division. So, you know, Friday night against West Ham was not great, but mm -hmm. in the main Wednesday night against Newcastle was was much more like you, you come to expect of Bielsa's team. And, and I think he was asked today at his, his press conference, what, what do you make of, of 17 points so far? And he said, it's decent. And I don't think it, it would have been unfair if we'd had a few more than that. And I'd, I'd go along with that. I'd, I'd certainly agree. And then in terms of this whole um, burnout theory that is associated with Bielsa, you know, people say that his um, style of management and training, you know, can only last for a few, a few months or not long enough. And then eventually his players tend to burn out. But um, that really hasn't really been the case, has it? No, and I think it lacks a, a bit of context. I mean, certainly his first job at Newell's, by the end of it, uh, he was exhausted. You know, he he'd kind of got to the point where he didn't feel like he, he could carry on as head coach. He'd, he'd definitely blown himself out. Um, but Newell's have been very successful. They'd won two titles. They got to the final of the, the Copa Libertadores and, and been quite unlucky to lose that game. And I, I did a, a closer look at this last season and, and went through some of the previous clubs that he's been at. And it seemed to me that at most of them, he was being asked to, to punch above the natural weight. So mm. at Bilbao, for example, the, the form in the first half of the season was very good. They were really prominent in La Liga. They got to the final of the Copa del Rey, 
They got to the final of the Europa League. They played more than 60 times in that season. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Herrera said to them, they said to um, somebody recently in an interview he did, he said, look, at the end of it, you know, these were his words. He said, we were fucked. You know, he said we were. But I think the reason that they were was because the fixture list was so intense mm-hmm. and they were travelling all over Europe. You, you tend to find in the, the Champions League that a lot of the games, particularly in the latter stages, are, are kind of based in Western Europe. So, you know, Germany and, yeah. and Italy and France and Spain and, and Holland. Europa League can take you everywhere, and, and it did take them everywhere. And I think I think ultimately they, they just didn't have the legs to, to keep it going. But I don't think that's the same as burnout, really. Mm. I think that's just the case of a kind of unnaturally long season that, that in the end was always going to catch up with them. And likewise at Marseille, they were in the running for the title and the one full season he was there and then dropped off slightly. But, you know, again, he'd, he'd made a big impact on, on them. And, and then you, you move on to Leeds, where... He's inherited a squad or did inherit a squad that had finished 13th. And to be honest, looked so far off the playoffs that we were amazed when he came in that that, that he was willing to stick with so many of the players and that he mm. wanted so few changes to the group that he had. And it's been the same thing again, taking a, a club that you know or a squad that were a long way out of the running and, and turning them into a side who should have won the, the title or, or certainly gone up in the top two in his first season and did win the title by 10 points in his second. So... I do feel that burnout is a bit of a myth and, and a bit of a, a lazy stereotype that follows him around. And, and when you look into it more closely and when you see the, the proper context, I think it's all far more, you know, far more complicated and far more detailed than that. Definitely. And if you look at the game on Wednesday against Newcastle, that would prove the opposite. Well, absolutely. And I mean, the, the thing we were laughing about on Wednesday night was Tim Sherwood on the, the Amazon Prime coverage who was saying you know his words these have blown a gasket you know they're Mm -hmm. supposed to be the fittest side in the league and they look tired against West Ham the difficulty these days for for analysis like that is that you've always got statistics to compare the the kind of visual perception to Mm -hmm. and and you know Bielsa is usually very honest about this so I don't doubt him but he said that you know the, the physical output by Leeds against West Ham was the second highest of the season. Um, and he also made the point that both West Ham and, and Chelsea went far beyond um, in terms of their physical output and the distance they mm-hmm. covered, far beyond their usual stats in both of the games against Leeds. So if anything, the, the reality of it is that the other sides are kind of increasing their levels rather than Leeds decreasing. And, you know, they, they cannot come into this league and play brilliantly 38 times they cannot come into this league and, and wipe the floor with teams who are really established and, and have very very good squads themselves so there are going to be days when it goes wrong but I, I always feel with Bielsa and there's no doubt that we're very big advocates of his round here we're all very much sold on the project and what he does we've all I, I think we've all pretty much invested in the idea that he's he's extremely special as a coach but I do sense some scepticism out there and I do sense in some quarters some so sort of quiet satisfaction when it, it goes wrong for him because quite clearly not everybody thinks he's a genius. Mm-hmm. Um, AJ, what do you make of uh, Leeds so far this season? Do you know what? For me, Leeds have been phenomenal. And um, one, when they did get promoted, I, I was one of the first people to say, do you know what? I think they'll hold their run in the Premier League and will surprise a lot of teams. And, you know, the result the other day kind of proved that for me. I think, I think... Bielsa is a fantastic tactician, I think. And I think he's just got the balance of the players just right, you know. And you look at someone like Patrick Bamford, for me, who who I believe is Leeds' top scorer at the moment, and you look at his career and, you know, he's been at clubs where he's not scored goals. There have been question marks of whether he can finish. And to be fair to the lad, he's coming to the Premier League and, he, and, he, and he's finishing the chances he's getting. I believe he, he should be probably in double figures by now. Um, I don't know if Phil agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he should be in double figures by, by now. But one thing I've noticed that like, Leeds are playing to his strengths as well. And, you know, when you see Leeds in full flow, they're exhilarating. And, you know, the other day kind of highlighted that, you know, five five goals. You know, they scored three goals in I don't know how many minutes. And I was, blow- I was blown away watching. So I think so far, Leeds are doing really well. And like I said, out of the promoted teams, I think they are the best team out of the promoted three. And they, they, I think they'll survive and do well. AJ, what about Fulham? <laughs> we don't speak about Fulham. There, there's nothing to say about Fulham. You know, they, 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 they yeah, we'll just leave Fulham to coach Dan because he's a Fulham fan. But look, I think Leeds are doing the right things at the moment. I think he's got a very talented crop of players. You know, we look at Rafina, for example, what a player he is. I don't know where he went and got him from, but he's mm. an absolute gem. He's got an eye for a pass. He's got that swagger about him. He knows he's good. He knows he's good enough. And he's starting to show it on the pitch. You know, I think Bielsa eased him in a bit and, he, and he's, he's playing really well, you know. So 
I just hope that they can keep Calvin Phillips fit. When he's not in a team, I don't think they're anything as good as what they can be. But yeah, I've been really impressed. Coach Dan, what's your take? You know, uh, bef- before the season began, I believe it was, we've done a piece on, on Leeds United. And, um, you know, I, I, you know when AJ began, he said, so like, he, he, he thought Leeds would be one of these teams that are coming and surprise a few individuals. As someone that, you know, uh, has um, been a big fan of Marcelo for a long time, there's nothing Leeds are doing that surprises me, if you get what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yes. In the sense that, it, it, right, yeah, it, it's in the sense that you know Marcelo's team, how they're going to set out. They're very industrious. They're going to make you work for every single thing for you to earn a point or, or, or you know, get, you know, three points against them. And I feel that's what they've been doing. But then again, they, they're also susceptible to losing games, you know, here and there. But I think that's okay. I think that's okay. They weren't, they weren't ever going to be a team that come and will be like, you know, they'll keep clean sheets game in, game out, and, you know, perhaps win every game. No, that was never going to be the thing. I feel I feel like this is Leeds. This is the identity, at least as it is now. And so what it is is that they're going to stay in the league. Hopefully they can hold on to Marcelo, build build on what they have as a squad, and just keep, keep reaching higher heights. Because, look, he's doing an amazing job with the crop of players that he's got. You know, AJ's already mentioned about Patrick Bamford. Look, Patrick Bamford is doing so well, guys, yeah, that he's keeping Moreno on the bench. Moreno is an international Spain player, you know, Mm. and he's keeping him on the bench. I think, although I think that if we can find a way to get those two on the pitch, it will work like, you know, miracles for them. And again, with Rafinha uh, around them as well. So that's something I'm sure he's smarter than me. So I'm sure that's something that he's pondering on. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, and, and you know, the thing with burnout, just quickly, I, and, and I think Phil made a good point that that burnout thing can be an excuse. And I think it's an excuse where, you know, you, you expect from, I don't know, perhaps lazy players and stuff like that. Because, look, he's demanding. He's going to demand a lot from you. Now, if you're a player that don't welcome that, yes, you're going to be burnt out. But then that just means you, you're not up for a challenge. <laughs> you know, you're not up for a challenge. Then perhaps you're in the wrong sport or you're playing for the wrong team because there's no negotiating that with Marcelo. Right, there's no mm. negotiating with that, and and I think on for him looking at his Bilbao team and and Leeds is that the squad isn't massive. You know, it's not a big squad. That the way Bilbao was set up is that they only get from within, right? So the players that you start the season off with is usually the players that you're going to end up with, and so you have if they play sixty odd games, that's a lot of football. You see what I mean? That's a lot of football. That's a lot of demands and stuff like that. And they've done amazing, so they can't really complain about that. This is what footballers get into the game for. And so when it comes and or whether you you know you want to join Leeds or play for Marcelo, you go have your mind set right that this is what this guy is gonna ask of me. And are you up for the challenge or not? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um and the I mean the, the opinion is divided obviously in the game over certain things. So for example, there would be managers who think that the size of squad that Bielsa rolls with is is not big enough. And you know, I think that attitude was was particularly prevalent in the championship because of the number of games, the number of league games, let alone anything else, down at that level. But it's it it it's a philosophy thing with him and, and it's also a case of his reluctance to have particularly senior players at the training ground, who are very unlikely to play. He much prefers to have a maximum of two players for every position. You'll see and find loads of versatility with, with individual players. So, you know, Ailing can play at right back or centre back. Phillips can drop back and play in the centre of defence too. Everybody's able to move around. Most players are, are able to adapt, to adapt. And it means that he doesn't need... I mean, when, when Leeds submitted the 25-man squad for the Premier League, I can't remember the exact number, but I think there were about 19 players in it. You know, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't... They weren't in a situation where they were having to, to ditch Ozil or anybody else. They, they mm-hmm. actually had had space left, but but not space that Bielsa particularly wanted to wanted to fill. Um, and yeah, I mean, to, to go back to what you said at the start, there's no surprise with this at all. I mean, they... they they played in the championship really like Premier League sides do. So when they were on, you know, in possession and, and going forward, you would be talking about a, a front five or a front six rather than a front one in Bamford. You know, it, it very quickly converted into 
players in or around the box and, and you know, heavy pressure on the opposition. And, and if you look through, certainly the top end of the Premier League, the way that Liverpool play, the way that Manchester City play, the positions they like to get in when they're on the ball and, and on the attack, it's, it's very, very similar. So I think the thing we all felt confident about was that Leeds would win games and would, would pick up points. And just to touch on Fulham and, and Scott Parker as well, I mean, I, I've never really been too sold on Parker. I've never been hugely convinced this, um, by him as a coach, certainly in the, the short period that he's, he's had. Yeah, um, mm. and but I think you you are on a bit of a hide into nothing, certainly in that sort of job when you're compared to Bielsa, because, you know, Bielsa takes risks and he, and he takes gambles, but he's been doing this for years and, and his tactics and his ways of, of coaching and conditioning players is so ingrained that he's not learning on the job with any of it. And I think... It's not easy what he's doing, but it's easier for him because it's his style. Now, I think coming up as Billich or um, Parker or even being in, you know, Steve Bruce, David Moyes, it's a real challenge to to look like you've got anything like the same sparkle in, in your players. Because quite honestly, how many other teams, uh, you know, a great example at Villa when Leeds are 3-0 up into injury time. And they produced this seven on four on mm-hmm. Villa, on, you know, around Villa's box. And there's just no need to play like that. But it's great and it's fascinating to watch. And you've got Bielsa barking at them and, and hassling them right the way through injury time, even though, you know, Villa have packed it all in and, and thrown in the towel and it's done. Um, it's it's hard to it's hard to replicate that. It's hard to do that if it isn't your your natural style. And the the one thing I think we've all realised about him is that he is an absolute one off. There really isn't anybody else out there like him. Absolutely. No, nah, I agree. I agree with you there, especially when you're saying you know if it's not a part of you and it's not in your makeup, you can't fake it or you can't try and give something that you don't have. And and, and the managers that you you mentioned, it's true. You know. You look at, for example, someone like, yeah, all right, let's say um, West Brom just got rid of um, Billich and they've brought in um, Sam Allardyce. We all know that Sam Allardyce in the 89th minute, you know, wouldn't be barking at his players to, to, to get forward to be seven on four like Bielsa would because it's just not in his nature, it's not in his makeup. So now, nah, Bielsa's a very fascinating individual indeed. And you are right, I think he is one of a kind, for sure. Do you, do you know the other thing as well? I don't mean that he doesn't value his job and I don't mean that he disregards it or he's blasé about it, but I don't think he thinks of tactics in football in the context of protecting the position he's in and protecting his employment. It's, 100%. Not, that, it's, it's not that he'd be happy to be sacked ever and it's not that he'd be happy to see his football fail, but he would 100% always commit to getting sacked because of his football rather than altering his football to make sure that he that he didn't get sacked and I think because he, he doesn't seem to suffer from that you know the fear of what's coming from the boardroom above him he's just always free to play that the way to play the way he wants to play and I can't imagine that there are many other managers who are, who are able to be like that and don't get me wrong he's, he's earned a lot of money over the years and he'll, he'll be a wealthy wealthy man in his own way but still I mean you saw the quotes from Allardyce this week where he was saying you know I, I was itching to get back in it had almost got to the point where it had been too long and I was I was kind of desperate for it mm. I, I mm. don't think Bielsa would Bielsa I think misses the game and, and misses coaching and misses management but I don't think he, he ever feels that he, he should keep himself in a job by, by doing something Something that isn't him. Yeah, and I think I think just to sum up what you were saying perfectly is just that he believes in his philosophy and his way of doing things, and he will he would he 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 die on that sword if that makes sense. He would die on that sword if if he if he had to. Do you know what I mean? He would never change or water down what he's about. And and you know you can only respect someone like that. There are many managers who you know when it's not going well, when they've been trying to enforce their philosophy, for example, they just quickly it's it's a twist. They don't stick. They just twist straight away because you know th- there's a fear of the board and not being in a job, etc. But whereas with Bielsa, he's just completely the opposite. It's the whole Plan B thing, isn't it? We we you know we spoke to him a lot about this in in the first season. Although those of us that, that sort of cover leads regularly came to realise pretty quickly that. As he put it, you know, plan A is basically, or plan B is basically take plan A and do plan A better. Um, and plan C would be do plan A better again. You know, that there isn't, uh, there's no sort of alternate way. Um, and, and some, you know, some might say that's a handicap for him. I, I do think that from time to time, versatility and, and flexibility is a, is a virtue for a manager. And, and he, he might accept that himself. But I think he's, he's got to the point, and, and he's been like this for a long time now, where 
he knows what he knows and he's got confidence in the things that he's got confidence in and and, and he doesn't want to to break away with that. And I, and I have to say, when, when it goes as well as it has for Leeds, you, you couldn't really advocate him breaking away from it. You know, he isn't going to react to two bad defeats back to back against um, Leicester and Palace by switching to two up front or, or you know, going with a, a flat five in midfield or, or anything like that. It just isn't the way it's it's going to go. And and more often than not, even when the little periods where he's been under pressure and the results have been poor, he's always found a way of turning it around without changing very much, which is quite a skill. Absolutely. And then um, turning our attention to Sunday's game against Manchester United, which, of course, is a classic rivalry. It's Yorkshire versus uh, Lancashire, Busby versus Revy, um, Alan Smith as well. Um, obviously, he played for both Man United and Leeds. Um, first of all, Phil, um, what do you remember about some of the old clashes between um, these two sides? I remember um, a quote from the Yorkshire Post in um, the 1965 FA Cup final, semi-final, sorry, where it says, both sides behaved like a pack of dogs snapping and snarling at each other over a burn after um, Jack Charlton and Dennis Law got into a punch-up. What are your memories of United and um, Leeds over the years? It's always interested me, this rivalry, because it's not intercity. Um, it, Manchester United obviously have City over the way. They also have their own big rivalry with Liverpool, um, but we've we've got a piece running on it on Sunday morning, a, a big look at the you know the history of the rivalry, where it came from, why people think it's is so intense, mm -hmm. and I was looking at a quote from Alex Ferguson where he was saying, you know, Leeds, uh, Liverpool, Manchester United can be really intense, it can be really vicious, it it can be, it, you know, the atmosphere can be can go well beyond what it should. But even that doesn't ever touch on Man United Leeds. It's just a, on a different level. And and he was pretty confused by it. He never understood why there was so much hostility and, and so much hatred there. But he was very aware of it. And particularly at Ellen Road. I mean, Ellen Road is, is more raw. It's, it's, you know, it's it's not as corporate as Old Trafford. Um, everybody you speak to kind of says that that's where the, the atmosphere um, was was at its height, but I mean, I I, I was young, obviously, through the the nineties and the early two yeah. thousands when the clubs were playing, and, and I'm I'm quite a good example. You know, I I never covered a, a league game between the clubs mm -hmm. at all, and and I've been writing about Leeds now for for fifteen sixteen years. I wow. I was there for the the FA Cup game in two thousand and ten, so I remember the Beckford goal very well. Yeah. Um, I was there for the League Cup game, um, the following season that, that or the, a couple of seasons later that that Leeds lost lost heavily at Old Trafford. Um, but it's it always lingers. It always lingers. Someone was speaking to me last week about Leeds Chelsea and how there's the you know there's that kind of lingering rivalry there as well. But it doesn't feel in any way comparable to me. This you know that's kind of rivalry and, and antipathy. This certainly from the the Leeds end. This feels to me like proper hatred. Mm -hmm, definitely. And then in terms of how the match will go itself, we know um, that Leeds have saw when they struggle, they struggle when it when they come against teams that obviously play on the low block. Um, defences are congested. Um, how do you see um, both Bielsa and then Solskjaer approaching this game? I wonder with Solskjaer. I mean, mm. he, he it, it, it seems to me that he's happy to, or content to be fairly negative with his tactics and, mm. and doesn't feel the pressure. I mean, a little bit like Parker, I'm not sold at all on, on him at Manchester United. Um, but it, it I, I think with a lot of players, and it makes a difference um, at at Old Trafford with it being empty at the weekend. But I think yeah. a lot of players would feel that being Manchester United players at home, they would be expected to play on the front foot against Leeds and be aggressive and, and be expansive and, and to look like they were trying to win the game. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it's different because the ground will be essentially empty. Yeah. And, and I think with, with Solskjaer, he, he doesn't seem to let that bother him particularly. I, I think they will be fairly tight and compact and I think they'll look for, a bit like they did at Sheffield United, I think they'll look for Pogba if he plays and Fernandes and, and others to pick the gaps and, and to use their pace going forward because there's no doubt. And if you look at... Um, Jamie Vardy in particular, um, and a couple of others against Leicester. You know, you can get at Leeds with pace because mm -hmm. they do leave gaps in behind. You know, that that's the, the nature of, of Bielsa's system. So you've got Martial, you've got Rashford, you've got Green, Greenwood if he plays. The, the, there are ways in which they can go, do damage. I think if Leeds are to win, I, I do feel like they need to score first on, on Sunday. But I think they can, and I think the, the potential is there. I think um, if Manchester United are going to win the game, then it's the, the pace up front that's going to do the damage for them. And then in terms of team news, do you think um, he'll go with the same side that beat um, Newcastle midweek? 
I think so. He doesn't have a huge amount in the way of choice. Um, Robin Koch is still injured, the German centre-back. I think it's probably unlikely, although he didn't comment on him specifically today, that Diego Llorente will be missing as well. But the, the thing about Bielsa is he... he he, he doesn't tend to to mix the team up much when things go wrong. Um, and when things go well, like they did on, on Wednesday night, um, he's even less inclined to, to do anything. So I imagine it will be the same um, the same 11, if not the same 18. Um, and it has to be said, they were very good on Wednesday. I mean, the goals were soft, the goals were cheap. They were mm-hmm. kind of nicked by Newcastle, despite Newcastle not having much pressure. But if you look at the bigger picture of, of what went on, it was a really, really comfortable and, and resounding win in the end. Uh, Coach Stan, how do you expect this game to go? What are you um, excited about seeing in this game? Well, first thing first, I think United would fancy this game away because for yeah. some reason, they seem to be playing freely, even though they're still shifting goals. They seem to, you know, winning games away and stuff like that. It's just their, their home form that's letting them down. You know, it's weird because you, you look at someone like Leeds, right, who by all purposes should be in the Premier League and they've got themselves a manager who is well experienced, you know, in, in, in the football world. Then you got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who's at this football club that is known around the world. And him himself as a manager isn't that ex- that much experience, you know. He hasn't really done things that, you know, stands him out to be like, this is a United profile. And I think United, after Ferguson left, tried to get, get you know, some world beaters into the club. But then... After that, you just thought, okay, let's change it to a different way. And now they brought in Soska, and I don't know, he's just, they've been hot and cold. Because I was, a, you, you take sort of like their Champions League form, right? They had like nine points in the first four games or whatnot. Then they go and lose the last two, and now they're out in the Champions League, you know? And it, it, similarly to, 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 you know, how Leeds are just like Jekyll and Hyde in a way. And it's not surprising. Mm. It's the same thing I feel for United. It could it could be that you know, perhaps they 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 wipe the floor with Leeds United, or Leeds will give them a game and even nick a win. And you you don't want to find United in that position where you're not 100 percent sure this is going to be a win because they for a long time they've been that club where you know when they're playing these kinds of club you're thinking oh it's going to be a win. And on paper, right, you would think so. But one thing, one thing that, you know, we cannot hold against Bielsa's leads is that when they've come up against his big hitters, right, you look at Manchester City, you look at Arsenal, mm. he's going to give them a game. He's a tactical genius and he loves, he loves this sort of like, almost like a chess kind of game, you know, you make a move and I'll make a move, you know, and I think he enjoys that with these kinds of managers. So, so, so it's weird. It, it will be, I can't put my finger on it. I can't put my finger on it. Who's going to win the game? But what one thing, that seems that we, you know, won't, won't, won't be, we, we won't be at a loss with is that it's going to be an entertaining game. I'll be very surprised if it wasn't an, an entertaining game. The only thing that's missing is the fun. So one, one thing, one thing I'm expecting is um, United, United perhaps will, will, will again try to switch to the diamond and have um, maybe Pogba come back into the side. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's going to be an exciting game and, and, for the neutral as well, you're gonna to want to be watching that, you know. It will just be. I feel. I feel like for you look at social, yeah. If he doesn't get a win against Leeds, I don't care how good they've been doing away. I think he he just digging himself a hole, and and I'll be surprised if that carries on the home form as it is anyway. And United don't say anything about it. The, d- the difficulty with the diamond for Solskjaer is that it can make you very narrow in the middle. And the, one of the cruxes mm. of Bielsa's team are the fullbacks and the, the way they overlap and the way they, they work the flanks. Solskjaer will have to be really careful that his fullbacks don't get exposed and, and that they're not they're not caught out, out wide. What you were saying about you know both teams um, blowing hot and cold, I, I agree with. I think the difference is that in Leeds, you feel like it's part of a process and part of a project and, and you know, yeah. building towards bigger things. I, I feel with Manchester United that with Solskjaer, it's it's kind of delaying the inevitable. It's, it's always at the point at which it feels as if it's going to blow up. They, they just do enough to, to calm the fire for a little bit longer. But you know fine well that it's not very long before it's going to come round again. I mean, he, he might it might be that he proves everybody wrong and, and that, that it, it goes well, you know, he, he finds a way to make it go well for him longer term, but 
I do feel as if with Solskjaer, it's going to end with, you know, at some stage, him getting sacked and, and people kind of concluding that in, in the main and over the piece, it was a kind of pointless experiment and, and ultimately it's been a bit of a waste of time. Uh, AJ, how do you see this game going? I agree with what both Phil and Dan have just said. It will be a fascinating tactical battle. Um, I think it'll be a very open game, if I'll be honest. I think it'll be a very open game. I don't think I don't think Solskjaer will play the diamond just because of the threat of the fullbacks overlapping, as Phil mentioned. I also think <laughs> Phil said if Leeds score first, he thinks they'll probably win. <laughs> um, United are what is it? I think is it ten games now that they've gone behind and come back to win. So I hope Leeds will be the ones to break that. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be a fascinating, a very open game. I think if Leeds, if Leeds can just you know, contend with Rashford with the pace and and get closer to Fernandez. I think they'll have a fantastic chance of winning that game. I think it's Fernandez who makes things tick for United more than anyone at the moment. And then, of course, Rashford's the one up front, out the front three. He's the one who who's on fire at the moment. He's the one who's hit the top form. So, but I be, I, I think there'll be goals in the game, and I'm gonna go for Leeds. I think Leeds will win it. I like that score score prediction, AJ. Oh, you love doing <laughs> it. It's coach who never gives up a good prediction. So, um, I'll go. United the other night against... Team United the other night against Sheffield United. When Sheffield United scored the second goal, United looked so vulnerable. But throughout the whole game, for a team at the bottom with one point and minus 13 or whatever it is, Sheffield United had chances against United. So I think it'll be high scoring... Oh, can I see? Leeds 3-2. Yeah, I was thinking the same as well. Uh, coach, score line and prediction? I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Leeds and Marcelo, but I think United should should look should take care of this game. If I'm being honest, um, if you're if you're expecting a score line from me, I'm not good with those. But 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 I think I'm on a good streak because I, I I told you guys True. Liverpool were going to beat Tottenham, so <laughs> I'll, I'll stick I'll stick with United because because it's like few have said, you know, I think. Social's got to sort of like get some winning run going and it can't just be like, oh, we, we win today, we win tomorrow, then we lose, then we win, then we draw, then we lose. He's got to get something going because now they're in the Europa League and it's sort of like you, you're looking at, you know, people will be saying, and people have been saying, they can win the Premier League because they've got, they've got the players to. They just got to find a way to stop conceding goals. They've got to find a way because they've spent a lot of money on that side of their field. So, um if they can just sort that out, I think I, I absolutely agree. I think they're one of the dark horses for this season, which is quite a bizarre statement to make because they're United. But for the well, game, tomorrow, I mean, on, on the weekend, I think I think um, I think United United should take the points or three points. Just touching on what you said about United being dark horses. Look, you're right. It is a weirdo, but when you look at the table, they're there. You know, I think I think they might even have a game in hand. You know, they're there. They're there and about. So it, so, you know, of course, we've only played, what, 13 games, but uh, just don't count them out. They're, 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 like you said, on paper, they should be winning the Premier League, you know, or be top two. But hopefully Leeds give them a real shock to the system and um, can enjoy the weekend. Definitely. I think, you know what's funny? I think Mourinho would, would have fancied this United team, don't you think? Maybe with Lukaku, but... 100%. They couldn't give him Maguire. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and then Phil, what's your predictions um, in terms of how you see this game going? I'm I'm with Dan really. I, my my head says home win by a really tight margin. It's it's the pace that concerns me. That in, in you know from dead ball set pieces, leads are vulnerable in that sense. But in open play, pace is where you you do get at this team. Um, but I think something tells me that it will turn on really fine margins on Sunday. I can't see either side cantering this one at all. I, I think it will be will be really close. And I guess if the, the obligatory Fernandez penalty comes at some point, then you know that's that's gonna help Manchester United. <laughs> um, if, <laughs> if, I love if, how, I love how you use the word obligatory. <laughs> <laughs> it tends to be from what I can gather. Um, if Leeds, Leeds will create chances though, they will create chances against this defence, I'm sure of it. And if they take them and if they're clinical, then the game's there to be done. So I'm I'm struggling to call this one, but I just have a, a sneaky feeling that that they might have a bit too much. And then uh, finally Phil and um, we asked all our guests um what is the best match that you've seen live um, in person? Wow. <laughs> the, 
The most ridiculous game I've ever seen was the semi-final against Derby in Bielsa's first season. I mean, it was not enjoyable, and you know the the result was was obviously crushing for for anybody who's wanting Leeds to go through. But in terms of just the absolute mayhem of it, it was <laughs> it was really difficult to to keep up. I mean, I I always say one of the the best I've seen, and and if I take out the promotion game for Leeds in um in 2010 when when they went up um yeah was the 2008 playoff semi-final away at carlisle when johnny housen scored twice and, and scored the winner in, in the last minute that was mm. that was fantastic but but more recently the one they'll win at swansea where hernandez scored in the 90th minute that that was even minus a crowd that was absolutely electric because you you just knew at that point that leads were going to get there you always had that doubt because there's always that doubt at least they have an unbelievable way of digging themselves a hole from a position where it seems like they're, they're in no danger at all. But um, when that goal went in, and I think you saw it in the, the backroom staff as well, and even <laughs> yeah. Bielsa, you just suddenly you just suddenly knew that was it. And they still needed a couple of results. They still needed things to sort themselves out. But you just you could feel it on that night. It was that was phenomenal. All right, excellent stuff. Okay, so you've been listening to the Front Free podcast with myself, Big Will, Coach Dan, and a prodigy himself, AJ. And thanks again to our special guest, Phil Hay of The Athletic. Make sure you go and read read his work, listen to his podcast as well, The Phil Hay Show. And we'll be back again next week for another episode. See you next time.